Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, let's continue the week by week. Let's do a few uh, episodes of it. My name's Connor. Hello, guys. How's it going? Great. I can't hear your response. I hope you're doing well. If not, that sucks, but you'll be good soon. I like to learn about things and watch stuff. Subscribe, hit all the buttons. Subscribe to The Great War. You won't be disappointed. Preemptive like. Oh, yeah. Original link to the video. Top of the description. Right below that link to the Discord. Click on it. It'll send you right over there. Love to have you. Uh, DM me if you want. I don't think you have to be a friend with me to uh, DM. And, um, yeah, I'll assign you a role if you don't get one. And, uh, yeah, just let's go. If you aren't ready to learn, there's the door. This is week two. Let's go. Indy Nidal, and welcome to the Great... My name is Indy Nidal, and welcome to the Great War. We left off last time with the Austro-Hungarian Empire declaring war on the Kingdom of Serbia. And I'm going to begin today with a couple of telegrams. Now, in Russia, there were very real fears... Hold on. Phones, phones away. Phones away. Even if you're watching on one, throw it away. We begin today with a couple of telegrams. Now, in Russia, there were very real fears that Austria's plans might extend to more than just Serbian occupation or Serbian punishment. Russia thought that Serbia might actually lose her independence. You see, Austria had mobilized three quarters of her army, which was way more than enough to deal with Serbia. So on July 29th, as Austria began bombarding Belgrade, Russia partially mobilized her army just in case. The Tsar, though, did not want a war with Germany, who had pledged to support Austria-Hungary. So he telegraphed his cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm, quote, to try to avoid such a calamity as a European war, I beg you, in the name of our old friendship, to do what you can to stop your allies from going too far, end quote. He signed it, Nikki. At the same time, the Kaiser was telegraphing back, quote, I am exerting... I'm not talking to you as a Kaiser... I'm as a friend and a cousin, signed Nikki. At the same time, the Kaiser was telegraphing back, quote, I am exerting the utmost influence to induce the Austrians to deal straightly, to arrive at a satisfactory understanding with you, end quote. This was signed, Willy. However, that same day, the German fleet began to mobilize, and in response, the British fleet was sent to its war stations in the North Sea in case of a possible attack. Now, at that point, the Allied pair of France and Russia were putting pressure on Britain to declare that in case of a German attack on Russia's ally France, Britain would join the war. But Britain, especially the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, wouldn't commit. Okay, important stuff now. Germany told Britain in a secret message that if Britain remained neutral, Germany would take no territory from France. Secret message that if Britain... Important stuff now. Germany told Britain in a secret message that if Britain remained neutral, Germany would take no territory from France except her colonies. This provoked the opposite effect, though, showing Gray once and for all that Germany was committed to going to war against Russia. Now, in Russia on the 29th, there was no declaration of war, but... A draft of nearly six million men began, and the army was already moving towards the Austrian border. And it was at 5 p.m. So, so that that message to the British, the British weren't like, "Well, no, you you, you don't. We don't want you to take the the um, you know, colonial islands or, or territories or whatnot." It's more of like a, "Oh no, this means they're getting ready to fight Russia," and so. Rather than taking it as a peace offering, they saw like, oh no, this is going to get into a big war, and so it frightened them. And, and the army was already moving towards the Austrian border. And it was at 5 p.m. on July 30th that the Russian general mobilization began. See, the Tsar finally signed this order because of partial German mobilization and his worries about being unready on the Polish front. It all actually got a little confusing here. Okay, German Chancellor Bethmann Holweg telegraphed Vienna not to mobilize against Russia, but the same day, German Chief of Staff Moltke telegraphed his opposite Austrian number Conrad, mobilize at once. So who was really what? in charge? And then Germany sent Russia an ultimatum to stop all war measures of any kind against Austria and Germany within 24 hours. This was rejected. 
Now you could see that this was becoming a real mess, but at the end of July, all How are you, how isn't there one voice? How are two separate German officials high up in command giving that's just careless. The various armies were pressuring their political leaders because many of the leaders were against the war, but the armies were afraid of being unready and they all wanted to move as quickly as possible. On July 29th, a German ultimatum to Belgium was prepared. What? Belgium? What, little neutral Belgium? Why Belgium, you ask? It's in the way of France. Here's why. See, if Germany was going to war with Russia, she could not help but be worried about France invading her from behind because, again, France and Russia were committed allies. So here was the idea, the moment you've all been waiting for, the Schlieffen Plan. Alfred von Schlieffen had been the German army chief of staff from 1891 to 1905, and here was his big idea in case of a war with both Russia and France. France would have to be knocked out of the war immediately so all of the troops could focus on the more daunting task of attacking Russia, okay? So Germany would make a swift attack through Holland and Belgium, completely bypassing the heavily defended Franco-German border and sweeping down into Paris from the north. Moltke streamlined the plan a bit by skipping Holland, but the idea was to take Paris within six weeks and thus avoid a two-front war. Now, we'll go into that in more depth later. But Belgium was neutral, and Britain had a treaty with her. And on July 31st, Britain asked France and Germany if they would respect Belgian neutrality. France said yes, but Germany did not respond. So Britain eventually sent an ultimatum of her own. If Belgium were attacked, Britain would go to war. In all of these countries, people were enlisting like crazy and national Socialistic fever was going off the rails. In France, for example, Jean Jaurès, leader of the Socialist Party who was appealing to all the European working classes to stop the war, was assassinated on the 31st. Ironically, this actually caused more shock around Europe than Franz Ferdinand's assassination did. But it showed that in France there was a great deal of enthusiasm for the war. See, many people wanted revenge for the loss against Prussia over 40 years Prussian earlier. War. Back to Russia and Germany. Now, the day after Russia mobilized, Germany also mobilized. Now, this was presented in the Reichstag as purely defensive, okay? We have to mobilize to defend ourselves because they did it first. And this was pretty much the only way the German military high command could convince the Social Democrats to agree with the mobilization. Okay, now, here's a question I have, though. So, Austria and Serbia, because of the assassination, are getting into beef... It's only a matter of time. Germany's allied with Austria. Russia's allied with Serbia and will send troops. But Russia and Germany are talking and saying they both don't want war. And, and then two different German officials send stuff to Austria saying different things. And then Russia mobilize it. And then Germany just knows war is coming. And so come up with the Schlieffen plan. They know Russia is the biggest threat, bigger threat in the east to take Paris. They got to go through Belgium for that. Belgium is allied. Or United Kingdom said if they go through Belgium, they'll attack Germany. And then France seems very ready for war. They have, want revenge from the Franco-Prussian War. So maybe France isn't completely guiltless. I hope that the more I would learn about the start of World War I, the more I would kind of see who's a major cause. And it's the opposite. I, I keep thinking, let I keep kind of, oh, no, it's their fault. Oh, maybe it's, oh, it's, is it France's? Now, the day after Pyrrhus Russia mobilized, Germany also mobilized. Now, this was presented in the Reichstag as purely defensive, okay? We have to mobilize to defend ourselves because they did it first. And this was pretty much the only way the German military high command could convince the Social Democrats to agree with the mobilization. And on the evening of August 1st, the German ambassador gave Russia the German declaration of war, which resulted from Russia rejecting the German ultimatum to stand down. Actually, as it turned out, the German ambassador actually gave the Russians two versions of the declaration of war. One that claimed Russia refused to respond to Germany, and one that said the Russian response was unacceptable. 
Yep, that's the kind of thing you want to avoid in a diplomatic service. The Kaiser at first ordered an attack on only Russia, but Moltke convinced him this wasn't really possible since most of the army was already committed in the West. And that evening, German troops entered Luxembourg to secure the telegraph and the railways. Here we go. On August 2nd, German troops crossed into France for the first time in over 40 years, and there were several small border skirmishes. At 7 that evening, Germany gave Belgium an ultimatum. Give German troops free passage through Belgium. Belgium refused. On August 3rd, Germany declared war on France, and that same day occupied three towns in Russian Poland. On August 4th, German troops entered Belgium, and Britain declared war on Germany. Now, many of those in England who had been anti-war before were suddenly very much for the war. Gray, the foreign secretary, for example, now believed that if Germany wasn't stopped, then all European national independence was just a fiction. In the Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire began mining the Dardanelles on August the 3rd. Now, the Turks were not yet going to war, and we'll see more of them in a few weeks. But what of Serbia? I mean, this whole thing snowballed because of issues between Serbia and Austria-Hungary, right? Well, we're going to get into that in much more depth next week, I promise. Now, in much of Europe, there was huge optimism about the war. I mean, everybody really thought that they were going to win. Even though by this time there were several million soldiers marching around Europe, this was still the war that would be over by Christmas. The Russian High Command, for example, asked for new typewriters, but were told that the war would not be long enough to justify the expense. And because of all this, everyone's military plans called for huge immediate attacks, since there seemed to be no point saving resources for later when you could just win right now. But here's the thing. Whoa. No point saving resources for later when you could just win right now. Now, there seemed to be no point saving resources for later when you could just win right now. But here's the thing. The that? wars people looked back on were short wars like the Franco-Prussian War, but they really should have looked at the American Civil War to get an idea of how long and how bloody modern warfare was going to be. All right, on August 5th, the German Empire reached her first serious military obstacle, Liege. Now, that day, the Germans failed to take any of the 12 forts of the city. Ludendorff managed to enter Liege on the 7th, but taking the forts was necessary for the German advance. Germany brought in her big guns, and this was accomplished in only a few days, but this is really important. You see, France and Belgium had strategically placed fortresses all over them. They were very expensive and heavily defended, but one of the first things the war showed was the technological advance in artillery. Heavy howitzers could bombard fortresses from 10 miles away without real fear of retaliation. And the fortresses were just sitting ducks. So all of the fortresses attacked at night. And the fortresses barred fortresses Guys, from 10 miles away without... Kind of a dumb question, but, like, what what would happen? Like, how much do you think it, it could, like, bench press? Like, what what would happen if you stood on your back right on, on where you close the... Uh, rear loading artillery you know you close you put the the ammo in you close it look how powerfully it it pumps back real fear of retaliation and the fortresses okay. you're were dead just never mind. sitting ducks so all of the fortresses attacked in 1914 fell real quickly and all that money and all that effort to build them up was for nothing so to bring us up to date on August the 6th, Austria-Hungary officially declared war on Russia, and Serbia declared war on Germany. If you want to know what happened in the last episode, click right here. And let me know how you liked it. And if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, put them in the comments below. Now, if you follow us on the other social uh. media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, you can learn more about the Great War. We have behind-the-scenes footage ah. and all kinds of other background information for you. In the last two episodes, Week we've three. seen how the mobilization for war really got going and the usual political intrigue. And today, we're going to see a little bit of fighting.
I'd like to now direct your attention to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austria was now ready for war with Serbia, and on August 12th, 1914, the Austrian army invaded, having already bombarded Belgrade for a couple of weeks. A couple of things to think about, though. Austria-Hungary went to war to punish, destroy, or annex Serbia. But it's really funny when you think how little she seemed to realize that she had a much larger, much more dangerous enemy at this point. Russia. And a lot of the I thought he was going to say the Ottomans. Early Austrian maneuvers in World War I are a textbook case in how not to run a war. See, one part of the problem was that war against war Serbia Germany. was really popular in Vienna. So Army Chief of Staff Conrad... I mean, because they're stuck with such bad allies. ...was that war against in Serbia was really popular in Vienna. So Army Chief of Staff Conrad sent a lot more troops down to Serbia than you would expect, and a lot fewer to fight Russia than you would expect. And here's something else he did which really pissed off Austria's ally, the German Empire. In order to send an even larger army down to Serbia, he actually arranged for troops that were heading to Russia to your army down to Serbia. He actually arranged for troops that were heading to Russia to sort of secretly head to Serbia instead without telling the Germans. So when they found out, they were really angry because Russia had like a bajillion men and Serbia did not. Now, the Germans, understandably, asked if the troops could be rerouted back to the Russian frontier. And here is where you get an idea of some of the problems facing Austria-Hungary in this war. Austria-Hungary was multi-multinational and had a crazy railway system that reflected this. In different parts of the empire, the railways were different gauges, so trains couldn't go through. And in some places, the train lines would just end when they got to an internal border and you'd have to get off and carry stuff or else go the long way around because Hungary or Bosnia didn't want certain trade to happen with certain people. So when Germany asked Austria if she could reroute her trains and turn the troops around, the answer was no. They couldn't reroute single-track railways in the middle of total army mobilization, so the troops would have to go all the way down to the Balkans before they could be turned around and then sent back to the go all the way down to the Balkans before they could be turned around and then sent back to the Russian front. On top of this was a huge fear of railroad mismanagement. Now this was a justified fear, I suppose, because all nations knew that a country that could move her troops around quickly would have a big advantage over one who couldn't. So here's what Austria did. To avoid railroad problems, all of the trains were required to move at the speed of the slowest train on the slowest line for maximum coordination. And that speed was 10 miles per hour, 16 kilometers per hour. That's how fast bicycles go. Like a jog. So the Austrian army invaded Serbia at the speed of a bicycle. But eventually they got two armies into Bosnia, about 110 kilometers apart from each other, under the command of General Oskar Potiorek, who had never actually seen any military action before. Now, his army was poorly trained and equipped, and of course, the Slavs in the army were a little hesitant about fighting other Slavs. And Potiorek was also willfully ignorant of the modern aspects of warfare. Serbia, by contrast, knew all about modern warfare, having been in two wars in the past two years. The Serbs were also going to be fighting on their home territory, in the mountains, and managed to mobilize half a million people out of a population of only around four million. Pretty impressive. Of course, a lot of these people didn't have any rifles or any ammunition, but they certainly had confidence, which is odd, really, considering that there were four million of them and 45 million of the opposition. But Serbia really believed they were going to win. So the Austrians began crossing the Drina River to engage the Serbs, and we'll see how that went next week. In the West, the French mounted their first offensive of the war, occupying Mulhouse in Alsace on August the 8th. The German army counterattacked on August the 9th at Cernay and forced the French out of Mulhouse on the 10th. The French retreated to Belfort and then, on August the 12th, mounted a new offensive under General Paul Pau. Now once again, we'll see how that went next week when France and Germany clash for real. Here's what was happening this week in Britain. On August 7th, Lord Kitchener called for 100,000 volunteers, Kitchener being one of the few who thought that this was going to be a long war. Although, by the 10th, the Kaiser himself admitted some worries about it being a long war once Britain was involved. Now, Britain had no troops at all in mainland Europe. But I just want to point out about the Kaiser. I've been hitting on the Kaiser Wilhelm II a lot the past few weeks because I just... Thinking about starting the start of World War One, he just seemed like a figure.
that to me not a lot of people seem to be talking about, but clearly it's kind of, you're not as smart as you think you are. <laughs> and uh, there, I, you know, the, the message is to back to uh, Nikki from Willie. Uh, seemed to show a pretty competent leader there. She was the only country that had a purely professional army. It was small, but it was very highly trained. And total Serbia, 60 right? had no troop worries about it being a long war once Great Britain, Britain was involved. Now, Britain had no okay. troops at all in mainland Europe, but she was the only country that had a purely professional army. It was small, but it was very highly trained and totaled six divisions. Four divisions were to be sent to France, and on August 12th, the first troops of the British Expeditionary Force crossed the English Channel. In 10 days, they moved 120,000 men without a single loss. Also on August 12th, wow. France and Britain declare war on Austria-Hungary. It's interesting, actually, that England and Austria and Britain declare war on Austria loss. Also on August 12th, France and Britain declare war on Austria-Hungary. It's interesting, actually, that England and Austria had been on very friendly terms earlier, and Britain certainly had no commitment to Serbia or anything. But if you look ahead through the August weeks, Britain became the vocal defender of the rights of the Slavic minorities in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, especially the Czechs. On August the 10th in the south, two German warships managed to elude the British and enter the Dardanelles. The Turkish Minister of War, the pro-German Envar Pasha, let them enter and said that if the British followed, they would be fired upon. But the Ottoman Empire was still neutral, so the ships were sold to the Turks, given new Turkish names and raised so that if the British followed, they would be fired upon. But the Ottoman Empire was still neutral, so the ships were sold to the Turks, given new Turkish names and raised Turkish flags. On August 12th, two naval blockades were established. One, to prevent cargo from reaching German ports on the North Sea. What's the difference between Turks and Ottomans? Are all Turks Ottomans, but not all Ottomans Turks? And the other was a French blockade to cut off the Austrian ports on the Adriatic. In the North Sea, submarine blockade to cut off the cargo from reaching German ports on the North Sea, and the other was a French blockade to cut off the Austrian ports on the Adriatic. In the North Sea, submarine U-15 was rammed and sunk by the British, the first of nearly 200 U-boat losses Germany would suffer in the war. And in Central Africa, on Lake Nyasa, a British gunboat captured a German gunboat. The German captain was not aware that he was at war with the British. True story. And just because there had been no right time to mention this before... Hey, uh, how's it going, Brit? Uh, you're, uh, you're captured. What do you mean? There's a war going on. Ah, oh, crap. I'm going to mention it now. Back on July... Just because there had been no right... ...aware that he was at war with the British. True story. And just I because there had indeed. been no right time to mention this before, I'm going to mention it now. Back on July 25th, the Kiel Canal was finally opened so that Germany could safely and quickly send ships between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Now let's think about something here. Now that we have a full European war starting, though not yet... Why would they have that issue at all? What canal do you need to go from the North Sea to the Baltic Sea? Aren't there like a, a bunch of different ways through the, Den through the islands of, of Denmark? Why, why, do you need a, why do you need a canal? Now let's think about something here. Now that we have a full European war starting, though not yet a world war. Okay, yeah, we did have gunboats in Central Africa, but still. We actually have a bunch of totally different wars at this moment caused by different forces that make one big general war. Now, we've talked about this in earlier episodes, but let's briefly go over it again. Austria wants to go to war against the little guy Serbia because of guys like Chief of Staff Conrad, who have big imperialistic dreams. The Russians don't think that it's necessary for an entire Slav state to be destroyed because of an assassin or the Black Hand or whoever, especially when it's their only ally in a sensitive region. 
The British didn't much care about Serbia's fate. They were concerned with Belgium and German hegemony in Europe. The Germans want to take on Russia now because they fear that in a few years, Russia will be too powerful. But to do that, they also have to deal with Russia's ally, France, who wants revenge on Germany for the last war. See, these are all different wars. I'm playing that again. I did get that. That was so great, and I understood all of it. I'm just I'm playing it again. That was such well said. Austria wants to go to war against the little guy Serbia because of guys like Chief of Staff Conrad, who have big imperialistic dreams. The Russians don't think that it's necessary for an entire Slav state to be destroyed because of an assassin or the Black Hand or whoever, especially when it's their only ally in a sensitive region. The British didn't much care about Serbia's fate. They were concerned with Belgium and German hegemony in Europe. The Germans want to take on Russia now because they fear that in a few years... What if Germany stayed out of it? I, let me finish because I, I know, like, well, they got to back Austria. But why not have Austria-Hungary and Russia engage in talks? You know, like... So Britain, France was obviously ready to go, but it didn't seem like they were ready to attack anyone just yet. But the reason I, I don't really want to blame Austria or Serbia, or even Russia, really. It, and let me know if, if you think differently, if you think I'm wrong. Is that it could have just been a local uh, Balkan um, conflict that two big powers russia probably stronger than austria hungary russia say hey you know i'm i'm gonna invade you if if you um you know annex serbia or take over serbia or those ridiculous um points in the treaty that pretty much make it a dominion of austria hungary yeah you know wh why couldn't they just deal with it Years, Russia will be too powerful. But to do that, they also have to deal with Russia's ally, France, who wants revenge on Germany for the last war. See, these are all different wars happening at the same time, but for different reasons. Just thought I'd point that out. This is where I'm going to leave you today with German forces 80 kilometers from Warsaw. But come back next week when the carnage really begins. If you want to. Awesome channel. Awesome video. I did two today. I'll do two more tomorrow. Maybe the next day. All right. Or I'm going to upload these tomorrow, actually. So I'll do two more the next day. Um, for the next day. All right. Uh, awesome. See you guys next time.